In the month of February, we're, we're, we're taking the subject of I love. I love my church. I love my family. I love friends. I love my community. And today, I want to talk about I love my family, which is a real, real easy one for me to talk on because I, I do love my family a whole lot. Love all of my family. You know, the disciples came to Jesus one time and he said to them, uh, they said to him, your mom and your brothers, your mother and your brethren, they're out here, they want to talk to you. And he said something, it wasn't disrespectful, it was just the truth. He said, who are my mothers and my brothers but those that do the will of the Father? So uh, we have extended family, and that's the family of God. But today I'm going to talk about both. And so what I share with you in this very simple message I want to bring uh, will apply to, to both, uh, to both the family, your immediate family, and those who are uh, uh, above. But before I go into my message, you know I love kids, I love what kids say, and so I wanna share with you some of the things. They were asked what they knew about falling in love. So here's Glenn, he gave the first one. He says, uh, if falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't wanna do it, it takes too long. <laughs> Manuel says, I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something like that, but the rest of it isn't supposed to be so painful. <laughs> Good luck, Manuel. Um, no one is sure how it happens, why it happens, but I heard it has something to do with how you smell. That's why perfume and deodorant are so popular. <laughs> I love this one. Once I'm done with kindergarten, I'm gonna find me a wife. Uh, Tom, Tom's from East Texas. I'm gonna find me a wife. You know, it sounds just like a Texan, doesn't it? Mike says, on the first date, they just tell each other lies and that usually gets them interested to go to the second date. Uh, Jill says, I'm in favor of love as long as it doesn't happen when dinosaurs is on TV. Yeah, that's a future Hallmark movie uh, watcher right there. Uh, or football. <laughs> My mother says, here's Carolyn, my mother says <laughs> to look for a man who is kind. That's what I'll do. I'll find somebody who's kind, uh, tall, and handsome. <laughs> Kenny says, it gives me a headache to think about that stuff. I'm just a kid. I don't need that kind of trouble. <laughs> Remember that? Remember that when you said, when guys, when you reach that age where you, I don't care anything about girls. I don't, I don't care anything. I remember doing that. I don't care anything. I just lie to myself so much. I don't care anything about girls. Avia says, uh, one of you should know how to write a check because even if you have tons of love, there's going to still be a lot of bills. <laughs> Regina says, I, I'm not rushing into being in love. I'm finding fourth grade hard enough. <laughs> Floyd says, love is foolish, but I might still try it sometime. This is my favorite of all. Dave says, at age eight, Love will find you, even if you're trying to hide from it. <laughs> I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but the girls keep finding me. <laughs> oh, God bless our children. Love those little ones, don't we? I want to go to my scripture today, and it comes from 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, which uh, the, a lot of us call it the love chapter. And it starts with first. There are a lot of great things in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. I'd encourage you to read it over and over in uh, different translations. Uh, this is the NIV. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy. It does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So I just want to take that statement from verse 7. That's something you can take with you. A good, good one to remember. That love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love always protects, that's the first one. That word protect there, it comes from a Greek word that has a root, it comes from a root Greek word 
that evolves into a lot of things in the Greek language, but it, it means to roof over. It means to cover with silence. It means to conceal. It means to hide. That's a pretty good word, isn't it? Protection. So the idea of protection there is covering. It's like, don't throw people under the bus. Don't throw your family under the bus. How many of you know I can talk about my family as long as I want? You don't talk about my family, though. You talk about my family, I call Cousin Vito to come down from Chicago. This little boy was asked to define love, and he said, love is when my name is safe in your mouth. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, most important of all, continue to show deep love. Everybody say deep love. Deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. And that doesn't mean that it trivializes sin, but one of the marks of love is it seeks to protect the loved one, our loved ones. Doesn't mean that we excuse wrongdoing or that we try to evade the natural consequences of sin, but it simply means this, is that we, we strengthen what is weak, we shield what is vulnerable, and we forgive what is provoking. Uh, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, powerful chapter on marriage and family. This is Paul's admonition to husbands. It's in the message translation. Husbands, go all out in your love for your wives, exactly as Christ did for the church. By the way, we just sang about that a minute ago. Can you believe the amazing, amazing love of Jesus Christ. You know, I love that part that says that he came chasing us. He comes chasing us. God will chase you down. You know, very few of us can say, I was just searching for the Lord. I was searching. I kept on searching for, we used to sing a song. I kept on searching, searching, searching till I found. I wasn't searching for him. I was running, running, running from the Lord. <laughs> But he kept on searching until he found us. Wonderful love. The gospel. How many of you know the gospel is good news? The gospel is not. He came, gave us a lot of rules that if we will obey them, we'll be pretty good. At the end of the life, he'll kind of measure up how good we were. That's not what it's all about. It's about the amazing love of God that does what we could not do. Anyway, excuse me. I might get to preaching here. A love marked by giving, not getting <laughs> That's good for all of us guys. Y'all know what that means, don't you? Every time you hug your wife, you don't do it expecting something more. I mean, you just sometimes a hug is sufficient. Now, let me move on. I quit preaching, went to meddling. Christ loves, Christ's love makes the church whole. His words evoke her beauty. Everything he does and says is designed to bring out the best in her, dressing her and dazzling white silk, radiant with holiness. That is how husbands ought to love their wives. They're really doing themselves a favor since they're already one in marriage. So that is the covering, that is the protection. The other translation says that the Christ washes, cleanses the church with his word. It's amazing how words can, can wash us. The right words, fitly spoken at the right time, they, can, they have a cleansing effect on us. And by the way, all this is not just for the husbands or men, it's for the women too. It really does work. You can bring out the best of others by speaking the best to them. Washing by the word. And part of that covering and protection is taking care, taking care of each other. And there's a statement here. I find it still a little bit startling, but it comes from Paul, his word to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5. He says, those who won't care for their relatives, especially those of their own household, their own family, he says, they have denied the true faith. Some people are worse, such people are worse than unbelievers. And that's just kind of one of those scriptures that you have to take like, uh, a hard piece of candy if you're into candy. I don't like hard candy. I like mushy candy that I can, but uh, Delia likes hard candy. And so we have hard candy in the house uh, when we have candy. 
And it's just something, you put it in there and you just savor it. You just meditate on it. You, I mean, you just, mm, mm. And then you wait for it to kind of dissolve. That's one of these scriptures here. What exactly does he mean by the fact that it's, uh, that such people are worse than unbelievers? It just shows that God puts a strong, strong emphasis and a strong value on us taking care of one another. So love covers, love protects. Number two, love always trusts. I have faith in my family. I trust my family. First of all, I believe in and I have faith in the concept, the idea of family. There are some people who claim to be sociological experts for many years, This, uh, you know, since sociology, anthropology has been a major study that will say that the concept of of family is just kind of an ever-evolving thing. It's something that that has evolved. The idea of modern family uh, idea that's kind of evolved as the species, I guess, has evolved. Uh, Man discovers woman, woman discovers man. The two of them discover the birds and the bees, and then the babies come along. And they have to figure out how to take care of them. So it's been an evolving thing where we have finally come upon this idea that man and woman together with children, we call that a family. But eventually, eventually, as the uh, species continues to develop and through the uh, ever developing and every constantly changing realities of life, the traditional family as a basic social unit will evolve into something else. These concepts of survival are an ever, ever uh, evolving thing. Of course, I don't believe that. We don't believe that. Because in the beginning, God created man, created woman. He created family. So family is God's idea. I think it's a pretty good idea. But it's his idea from the beginning. So the second thing that I do is I have faith in my family. I not only have faith in the concept of family, but the outworking of family. Uh, we, we've all experienced some dysfunction in our families. Uh, people every now and then will say to me, you know, my family's dysfunctional. I say, well, welcome to the family of the human race. We are broken people. We are fallen people. There's not, a, there's not a perfect family in this place. By the way, God is God, and his family is certainly not perfect either. So f- there are a lot of imperfections. But I thank God that I can have faith in my, in my family. And I can trust my family. And I tru- choose to trust my family. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes but we don't have to live in the mistakes of yesterday. Last yesterday's mistakes don't have to be replicated today. We have faith, we believe in the process, we believe in God's process, we put our faith in it. People say that, many people say today that the whole idea of family, especially marriage, is just, that, that idea is shot, people don't get along, and they, they, they quote the statistics that Everybody who, all of the marriages, only half of them will last and all that kind of stuff. I understand, I understand that. But I also understand that we are broken people, that just because there is a breakup of marriage does not mean that, um, that God's wrong. It means that we are wrong. But I love family. I trust my family. I trust my immediate family. I have faith in them that God is going to do things in their lives. You know, when you speak faith into your family, uh, it's amazing how that reflects or how that comes back to you, giving them reasons to succeed and so forth. Sometimes we have a difficulty with communication, but I would encourage you to go ahead and try it anyway. Speak words of faith to your family. Sometimes when everything's going down, just say to your kids, everything's gonna be all right. They need to hear that. They need to hear that from people who've already been around, around the mountain a time or two. 
We went through tough times when I was a kid, but I'm here, I'm alive. Our kids went through tough times, but, but we're alive today and we're prospering today. So, you know, that we, we just have to continue to encourage, encourage one another. We can't tell exactly what tomorrow is going to be, but we do know this, that if we pray, God will make it better for all of us. Pray for a God moment when all will work out right. I like this passage. It talks about uh, fathers, um, but I'm not just picking on the dads today. Um, maybe a little bit of this will spill over here for others too. But in Ephesians, the sixth chapter says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Uh, one translation, do not provoke them to anger. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate, provoke your children. What does that mean? Don't tease them, prod them, tell stupid jokes in public, stuff like that. No, it says just, just don't put the kind of pressure on them uh, that will ignite uh, resistance and retaliation. So yeah, I'll give you some of the ways that we exasperate our children. And I know, because I is a dad, how many dads do we have here today? And so this, uh, you can relate to this. First of all, we can exasperate our children with unrealistic expectations. You know, maybe Junior doesn't want to become a doctor. And maybe your daughter wants to be the beautiful mom of 10 wonderful children. Maybe their vision is different, but I think sometimes we exasperate them by demanding too much from them, putting undue pressure on them that will feed rebellion and resistance. Here's another thing, it's not listening to them. You know, listening to somebody is not just hearing them, but it's hearing from the heart. We had three children. One of ours was the quiet child. I won't tell you which one he was, but he was our last one. And so he never talked much. And uh, I found that if I would get him in the car and just go driving, he would start talking. And then I couldn't shut him up. He would just talk and talk and talk. And I remember one time, I remember this well because it was on Conway Road in West County, St. Louis, Missouri. When we were pastoring there, we had church there. And I'm driving along, and Kenneth is in the car beside me, and he's about 10 years old, I think, at that time. And he's telling me something. And I'm hearing him, but I'm not listening. And then, and then, he, then, then he quit talking, and I said, oh, uh, what again? He said, never mind. You never listened to me. And boy, what a rebuke that was. I know, come on, tell me, come on. I don't think he ever told me what he was that particular time. But you know, you, that, that causes you to repent. You know, sometimes one of the best things you can do is, is gather your children around you and repent to them. Because uh, the, 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 if there's anything that I regret, it's the times when I said something wrong to my children. But in my anger, uh, I said something to them that I shouldn't have said. So we can exasperate by not listening. The greatest way you can serve your children sometimes successfully is to study them, find out what makes them tick and what ticks them off too. Find out what, you know, what, what it is about these, because they're all different. They're all different. They're all different. Did I say they're all different? You know? I always use this example because I knew that Delia loved me. I, I knew that she loved me when, because she paid attention to me. And here I am, I can't remember the dress that she wore on the last date, you know, when I first met her. But she remembers everything about me. And about the second or third time, we're sitting right here in Houston at this little coffee shop not too far from the Bible school, and the coffee came, and she made my coffee. She put the cream and the sugar in it just the way I liked it. And I thought, wow, this girl really likes me because she has studied me to enough to know. She's observant. So that's important to listen, to observe. 
Here's the third thing. We, we can do it by hypocrisy. We can exasperate our children through a hypocrisy. You know, you can cuss up a blue streak in front of them, and then they say one bad word, you just mete out all kinds of punishment against them. Guess who's watching? Boy, it's quiet in here today, isn't it? It's really quiet. <laughs> Here's another one. I, I'm just amazed the way uh, some parents talk to their children, even publicly. Don't, uh, uh, we, here's another way. We exasperate our children by berating them or belittling them. And people will say things they've never once said to themselves. Say things to the children like, oh, you did it again. Just like your Uncle Bartholomew. You're going to turn out and be just like him. You may as well just go ahead and put curses on them to do that. And public criticism is worse. Love them, protect them, and, and believe in them, and trust them, and show that you believe in them, and show that you uh, trust them. Here's another one, number three. Love always hopes. We had to close a private school that was in our church, Christian school. This is years ago, in our first pastorate. And we rented this building. We had this, actually quite a few kids coming to this Christian school. And we went through an economic downturn, lots of other stuff. Expenses were tight. We lost our lease. That was very difficult. Pulling all of the stuff out of that school and where we met for our church Putting it in a, uh, putting it in a storage unit somewhere. It was a painful and a difficult time. I, I remember I just felt I felt like a failure. I really felt like a failure. I was a young father at that time, young pastor, about 33, 34 years old, and I felt like I, I'm just over my head. I, 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 what I did was I allowed my vision to get ahead of my ability to perform. So it was all my fault. Anybody ever been there before? You just launch on out, you step out, out. you talk about buyer's remorse. You know, you've, you've got yourself out on a limb. And I remember just getting myself out on that limb. I said, oh Lord, I'll let give this to you. And the Lord said, I don't want it, you did it. <laughs> I said, no, no Lord, don't leave me in a lurch, please. I go down and pray and pray. You ever had that happen? About the time you get to the door out of the prayer meeting, you, your prayer room, you open the door and there it is, it's staring at you again. Boy, what are we gonna do now? So I'm in the living room on my face before the Lord and I'm pouring out my heart to him. I guess I am. I'm, I'm just, I'm crying out to God. Sometimes we, we, we worry out loud and call it prayer, but I, I think I really was praying and I was just pouring my heart. This little hand of my 12-year-old daughter on my shoulder. So I raised up, I said to Juliet, it's just this, honey, I've always wanted you to have the best. And I'll never forget, she said to me, she patted me on the shoulder, she said in a non-emotional way, as I'm I'm drying some tears out of my eyes. She says, Dad, I've got the best. I've got you. I've got Mom. I've got my brothers. They're both younger than she. So I knew that was revival breakthrough there that she was. <laughs> so I, there's no amount of encouragement. You know, you, you children encourage you like that. The rest of the world can just go to Texas. I mean, it's just like... <laughs> Praise God, somebody believes in me, somebody has hope, and somebody's pumping. We can pump hope, we can encourage one another, we can give one another hope. There's no amount of encouragement that can measure up to a family encouraging one another. You know, it's, it's one thing for, for me to encourage you, but when your own family encourages, you know, the people that li you live with all the time, <laughs> that know all of your faults, your fantasies, your faux pas, your failures. They know all of that and they still encourage you. Wow. Lord, yes, yes, yes. 
Psalm 127.3 says, children are a heritage from the Lord. They are. Offspring, a reward from him. Your children are a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Think of that. Are the children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man and the woman whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. And I'm not sure what all that means, but there is a passage of Scripture that says that when you are older, your children will rise up and call you blessed. I love that. I've said this before, and I'll say it maybe again, maybe it helps some of you. If I had it to do over when I was a kid, I would have been the consummate encourager in our family. I knew that my failure, my dad felt like a failure because he wasn't home the first nine Christmases of the 11 or 12 years of my life. Dad was gone. He was somewhere in the world. He was in the military. He wasn't here. And when he did come home finally, and we're about 13, 14 years old, and we have time with him, I'm about that age, I, we're, there was an alienation there because we just didn't feel... And, and I think, look back on that. I remember my mom and dad standing in the living room one day and, and they were talking, kitchen, and they were talking and it was uh, toward dad's retirement and it was his last parade. My dad was uh, at that time allied liaison officer at Fort Gordon. He had in a prestigious position there. And so it was gonna be a time to honor my father, that last parade. And I remember mom was saying to me, this will be dad's last parade. And I said, well, I don't want to go, but I'm sure glad it's the last parade. And I walked out of the room. Boy, I still just want to kick myself right in the rear for saying that. How terrible was that? But you know, I was hurting so deeply. And how many of you know that hurt people hurt people? And I was hurting so deeply that I just said that. And I thought, zing. I really put it in there, but I'd, if I had it to do over, oh man, don't you wish you had it to do over? I'm speaking to some young people here. You don't have to do it over. You can do it today. When you see your father, your mother, somebody in your family going through a difficult time to go up, put your arm around them, say, I know it's hard right now. I know it's difficult. My mother dealing with depression. My mother just, you know, in her 40s just had all kinds of medical issues and everything else. And, 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 the church, and we would sit down at the family table and sometimes the tension would be so much there because there was a perpetual hatred in my heart, my brother's heart. We, we, we just, we engendered this kind of thing. And then I had a younger sister that we picked on all the time. And if we looked at her anyway, you look at her cross-eyed, she'd scream, Mama, Paul's looking at me, just all that kind of stuff. And you know, if I had it to do over, I would have, I would have sat down. I, w I wish I could go back. I know you're not supposed to have regrets, but I'd love to go back to the dinner table at the age of about 13 or 14 or 15 and say, Mom, this meal is fantastic. You know you're the best cook ever. And I know what my mom would have done. She'd have broken down and cried. She had a prayer meeting right there. She would have gone to Holy Ghost camp meeting right there, just, just right there, because, because of that tension there that was there. But you know, there came a point when, when we grew up, when, when we got married, we said, okay, we're not gonna bring that kind of tension into the family. Now, thank God for Delia, because every night, I don't care what was going on, there was supper time. She made a meal. We didn't sit in front of the television. We turned it off. At that time, we didn't have much of a television. <laughs> we had a little 12-inch black and white. You had to turn the channels with pair of pliers. Remember that? <laughs> I wish we'd have kept that just for memory's sake. Put it up here and just celebrate the goodness of God. But she always did that. And I thank God for that. Because those were moments when we could speak hope into each other's life. And we could talk about the good things that God is doing. Here's what Joshua did before he, he was a leader, he led the people of God in the promised land. Before that historic conquest, he laid out a challenge to the, the nation. This was his vision. 
His vision was not material driven. His vision was value driven. Maybe he had a vision for his family. He says, so now fear God, worship him in total commitment. He's speaking to all of the nation. Get rid of your gods that your ancestors worshiped on the far, far side of the river, the river Euphrates. Going all the way back to Abraham. He said, those gods that were there, that Father Abraham was subjected to and his family before he went to the promised land. He says, you worship God. And if you decide that that's a bad thing to worship God, then go ahead, choose a God you'd rather serve. Do it today. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worshiped from the country beyond the river or one of the gods of the Amorites on whose land you're now living. Good, go ahead. Plenty of gods around here, choose one of them. As for me and my family, as for me and my household, we will worship God. Can we make that proclamation together today? Okay, guys, I know there's a lot going on out there. There's people pursuing a lot of things. So many times we, when we talk about vision, we, we ascribe it to success, material success. But our vision should not be material driven. It should be value driven. And that's one of the values right there. Because a value driven life, we will worship the one and true living God. A value driven life, it'll produce godly results. The fourth and the final thing, it says that love always perseveres. There's been a few times over the years when uh, I've looked across the table at Delia after disappointments, discouragements, downturns, rejections, or whatever. I would say, I got you, babe. I know that's not real spiritual, but boy, I'll tell you, it really works. You know, we have each other. It's amazing what you, have. I'm gonna share something with you. I know you know it, but maybe some of you don't know it, you don't realize it, but if you, for those of you who are married, can I just give you probably the best advice that I can give you or the best word of encouragement? Because it's powerful. Matthew 18, 19 says, when two of you get together on anything at all on earth and make a prayer of it, my Father in heaven goes into action. If two or three agree, come together. Now that come together, what Eugene Peterson says here in the message, the come together and make a prayer of it, that, that big sentence is just, he made that out of that one word agree. And that word agree comes uh, from a word that means that we voice it together. We voice it like a symphonic musical chord. We, we release it into the atmosphere. We give it verbal substance. We agree as touching anything. That means that we are going to say this together. We're going to emit this together. We're going to sound out the agreement. And actually that word is the word where phone comes for, phonograph and phon phonetic and everything else having to do with the voice. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And we do not have the creative power that the God of universe has, but let me just say this, that <clears throat> when he puts something here and you agree on it together, it's going to happen. You can make it through anything if you agree. Well, we're not in agreement. Well, you can pray that God will get you in agreement. And then say it. Well, I'm just not the talking time. Oh, yes, you are. Send you to a football game and you're up there. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> or watching WCF or MCG or whatever that fighting <laughs> channel is. What is it called? Oh, who said that? Okay, somebody knows what it's all about. Anyway. <laughs> Screaming, yelling, top of your lungs. Man, just get him, get him, get him, get him. Oh yeah, you are. So then we get home. 
And we're just real quiet about it all. But there are times when, when, when you need to speak it out together. We're, we're going, we're going to, we're going to see this happen. We're going to, it's just so powerful because God is, is committed to this thing we call family so much that if people who are already in agreement in this covenant with God will agree for something that is needed, something that is in the future, something that is a vision, a preferred picture, of, or a picture, a clear picture of a preferred future, and they agree on that, it shall be. So we're going to lose our house. Well, then you need to get together and agree on it. We're not going to. We're not going to. See, the enemy who would like to dissuade you has no power against the united word that you speak. Because when you're in covenant with one another, you can speak it together. I'm just pumping a little bit of hope and faith <laughs> in you today. Because this final thing he says there in verse eight is that love never fails. So if you love one another enough to protect, if you love one another enough to trust, if you love one another enough to hope together, and if you love one another enough to persevere or to endure, you'll make it. Now, everything that I've said is for the family of God too. So Christ Family Church, we are a family. And as a family, we are in covenant with one another. We love one another unconditionally. You can go out and do anything and you'll be forgiven. You will. Because the Bible tells us to forgive one another, to love one another. Somebody asked me not too long ago, says, uh, from another church, says, every time you come here to speak, you talk about love. I said, That's, that, I, I, I figured that one out, that, that love's what, it works. Just to love people. I don't have a whole lot going for me, but I can love. And when you don't have anything else going for you, you can love. And I probably said enough, so I'm just going to wrap it up right now. I want to pray for us. I want to pray that the love of God will strengthen each and every one of us and that we will strengthen one another with the love of God. And then I also want to pray, there may be somebody here, you've never really taken your life and given your life to Jesus. I'm going to tell you, it's the greatest decision on the face of the earth that you can really make. He's there. If you, if you sense that he is there, then he is there. And the very moment that you say yes to him, he comes into your life and he fills you and the Holy Spirit is there and the Holy Spirit within you will bear witness to the fact. In other words, it will speak. You will know, yes, I am one of his children. I am a child of God. And it didn't start today. It's been going on a long time. But today could be the beginning of that new journey with Jesus. So let's pray together. First of all, Lord, I just, I thank you for the family of God. I thank you for those that you have surrounded us with. We love each and every one of them. We just ask your blessing upon them. We ask your blessing upon this, uh, everybody within the sound of my voice today, those who are watching, who are listening, those who are here. And we just speak life and love to each and every one of them, first of all. Second of all, Lord, we lift up those who have never made that decision to just verbalize their commitment to you. Maybe it's been in the heart, but as you have given to us in your scripture in Romans 10, 9 and 10, the faith is in the heart, but when we speak it out, it becomes reality. So today, I'm gonna to pray a prayer, ask everyone to follow me in this prayer. Let's pray it together. There may be someone here today who prays it for the very first time, but let's pray. Just follow me, just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming into this world. Thank you for your life. 
Thank you that you gave your life that I might have life. I ask you today to receive me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. And I receive your forgiveness. I know you love me. And I know that you're receiving me. And today, Lord, I make this commitment to you that from this day forward, I am following you. I will rely on you to give me the strength and the power to be one of your disciples. And I thank you for it now. I give you the praise for it now. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Come on, let's stand together. Would you just give the Lord a good clap offering together right now? Lord, we bless you. We honor. Thank you, Lord.